he's hit that record button, hasn't he? I don't know if he has or not. You're a dirty, dirty, dirty trickster. I'm eating. How can I hit record if I'm... How can I even bring this into the show? I don't even know how you can eat those professionally over the microphone with your pie hole crunching away. You know, it, it's just so unprofessional. Did you have a good meeting? I did have a good meeting, actually. That's good. That's good. Yeah, things you're, are moving on. You ready? To, you ready to do do the thing we generally do? We're getting ready to do another farming podcast. We're doing another farming podcast. So these are my favourite. They are. They're mine too. Yeah, because they've got substance. <laughs> <laughs> and and most of it's, I mean, truth. Any way you look at it, I mean, it might be a variation of opinion, but everything we do and everything we've said on this show is truth in our eyes yeah i'm not going to say we're throwing any conspiracies out there these are all oh you can you can do your research and and back up everything we've said oh i think when from, it comes to big agriculture and, and big ag um, and yeah, yeah yeah the evil of the fda oh yeah well we, we tried to rustle him up into something right there and he didn't bite so no, he, see, he caught that one. yeah yeah he, he was on I, it pretty quick for whatever reason i mean your face just said start rec- start recording but well, anyway, play this stunt. They will hit the record button, try and catch me in a trap where I'm ranting very unprofessionally before the show even starts. So technically, we're off air. They want to catch me in an off air moment, but on air, doing something that I might consider regretting as an on air moment. It's a dirty trick. But if it was really that bad, we, Billy wouldn't have it. Oh, yes, he would. It's just fun to get you right. <laughs> oh, it's just don't start me off. <laughs> Come on, Billy. Right, start, I mean, you've been off, munching Billy. those crunchy things. Kick it off the way you normally do. So we're back. Oh. The Appalachian Podcast. I'm your host, Billy Riddle. And uh, with me, again, is my co-host, Chocolate Drop, Chris Montgomery. And um, but you knew that was coming. And I, you notice I brought him in first, too, you know, just as as the co-host and guest special co-host guest today, Simon Winch, because typically Simon always ends up becoming a second or third guest anyway. Hey, Bill. Yeah. That, 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 that don't work, work on me anymore. Let's, um, I, I'm, I tell you, I feel, I feel slighted. Look, if you've, if you've made it this far into this show, I promise stick around. It's going to be a good one. Uh, first off real quick, you can, uh, Patreon.com slash get on tap for our subscribers. Three dollars a month to get most of the stuff early. I've been fooling around with some stuff on Twitter here recently, and I really I really don't like social media that much, but there's a lot of people around the country kind of saw some of the same ideas we've got going on here. And they've got this thing called Twitter Spaces where you can just connect and basically just use your phone as a microphone. You're just sitting there having a conversation with nine or ten different people. I thought about investing into that a little bit. We can have basically it's kind of like us doing the Zoom show, except, you know. We're just talking to a handful of different people. We can do it for an hour or so, hit record, boom, I can upload it to Patreon, and then you can hear our Twitter spaces talking with all kinds. Like, we can just jump in and, you know, Spike can jump on for five minutes, say his piece, and get out the door, and somebody else might come. So, some cool stuff like are these that. Are these invited guests, or are they uninvited guests? Because well, the uninvited element... You Actually, can ha- scares the life out of me. You can have both, but what you what you do is you can, as, as the person who's hosting, you know, somebody pushes a button and essentially them raising their hand saying, I like to speak. You don't have to let them. You can, or you can mute them if they won't shut up. You know, I was just kind of paying attention to this kind of trying to find ways because, you know, what we have going on here in Franklin County, you know, I, I really have thought that it should be, uh, you know, kind of a, a beacon for everybody else, like a, like a, like a model for people to, to follow, you know, by bringing, you know, our best resources, that's, you know, whether, whether it be humans or time or whatever, bringing us together and making a better, and Spike really noticed that when he was here and a handful of other people noticed we got something really cool going on. So why not use like all these big, crazy follow, followers, you know, people, these crazy followers and numbers, why not try and get them on there and talk a little bit and bring some people over here paying attention to us and we can send them the guys like we have on here today and people we've had on the show before, you know what I mean? So, and you can do it. I just have to get a Twitter account, Oh no! but, but you can do it and you can do it from your house. You don't have to come here, do nothing. You can pop on, you can pop off. You don't have to stay the whole time. It's, it's but you, we can take that. And for people who aren't on it can listen to these conversations on our Patreon at patreon.com so let's get on tap just they call it tweeting don't they it's you don't have to tweeting. worry about being censored Elon owns it now 
Oh, yes, I've never been worried about yeah. being censored you, anyway. You, you still got to worry about that. That's all a bunch of horse and pony shows. It's all nonsense. But that's the best we got right now. It's a good way to reach some people. So for our Patreon subscribers, that's something new we got coming down the pipe for you. I think that'll be kind of interesting getting Simon on there, talking to people all across the world. Um, also, for people who take care of us, uh, Rocky Mount uh, Burger Company down there, Brian, uh, you know, uh, does wonders for us. We've got a couple events coming up here in the near future, so, you know, keep your ears to the floor about that. You know, it's right across there from from the Harvest. I haven't been over there. We went over there a couple of weeks ago. I hadn't had a chance to go, but I know Rick Reeves is uh, doing some some big stuff with the wrestling and stuff, so I'd like to make it down there and talk to all of them and get a burger and a beer sometime in the near future. When's that kicking off? I don't know quite yet. We're still in the works, but soon, hopefully. Speaking of kicking off, are we still doing the cook-off? I haven't spoken to Gail about it recently. Um, I don't think that would take much of a nudge to get that rolling in the right direction. I shall make a note of it. (laughs) (laughs) And also, shout out to Rocky Mountain Smokehouse and Buddy. You know, uh, they take care of us an awful lot, done a lot of good things for us. Buddy shows up, sticks around, like throwing his name out there. And the other night... Uh, the little one decided that's where she wanted to go eat at. She said, that's where I want to go. And so we got there. And uh, People like to make it a habit of calling and breaking people down every time they make a mistake. And very rarely do we as people ever say, you know, it was a pretty damn good job. I text the buddy at night. The food was as good as it's been, you know, any time I've ever been there. The, the service was good. Good music in there. It was acoustic, not too loud. You could hear yourself think. Just a good little atmosphere. And everything was really good. So, you know, it Make your way down there to Buddies as well and, and keep his hang on, it's, it's, town. It's, it's, Technically, it's called the Appalachian um, uh, Smokehouse now, isn't it? That's that's, that's the, the way we were. But, you know, what, what Buddy, what, where Buddy failed on that front, that's just our gain later because we now have the opportunity to snag it up. And who knows, Buddy, Appalachian Barbecue might be a thing here in a few years. And you, you missed your So now what's his new trading name? Rocky Mount Smokehouse. Rocky Mount Smokehouse. Yep. Okay, I've got to get my head around that because I'm just so used to buddies. Yeah, well, if it wasn't his damn name, it'd be a little bit easier to swallow. But, you know, now I just know him, so I'm just going to go down to buddies and, I'm, you know, going to see him. That's like an underground, you know. We all call it buddies because we're in the know. Exactly. Okay, I like that. Yeah. Underground. So, uh, you know, once again, patreon.com slash get on tap at we're going to have another uh, a couple cool things coming out here in the future. Next week, we're having uh, well, Philip Gibbs. He wrote a book, uh, Mountain Justice and Moonshine. Lordy, I've got somewhere around here. I can't think. But wrote the book. It's about uh, you know bootlegging the stuff about 20 years, 30 years ago, 40, whatever it was. Real deadly year we had back in the 70s. I'm pretty sure my grandpa's old. So we're going to, you know, some of our Patreon subscribers are going to get a chance to win one of those books. We'll draw your name out of a hat. Other people listen to the show, answer some questions. First one is... It's kind of stuff. Subscribe, help us out. And you're helping us bring on people like we got today and telling their story. So the more you help us, the more we can bring them out here, the more we can connect you all. And, you know, it's it's circular. It goes in circles. So, Simon, since you've been pushing for this show for a long time, I'm going to let you introduce our guests here today. Well, absolutely. To my left, of course, is our handsome Chris Montgomery. Thank you for using my, my name. Well, there we go. Well, absolutely. Why would I use any other? Well, some people like to go back to a decades-old nickname. It's a bit cheeky, isn't it? It's a new nickname to me. Well, I know it's new to, to you, but you know the backstory to it. So yeah, so it, old, well, yeah, old dogs believe, can I die. Believe, I don't believe you got to have an IQ above eighty to understand the backstory of it. I just <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so anyway, we I, know Chris. Is actually, a, there is a backstory. To we it. we know we know Chris is with us, but. He is a chap that um, I met several years ago um, whilst I was trying to develop my pastures um, with the correct variety of grasses. Um, and, and then we've developed a long-standing relationship um, where I get my non-GMO feed for my chickens, my sheep, my goats. Um, and we just have a great banter. And, and watching his business grow, of course, I'm talking about Daniel Austin from Green Sprig Ag. Daniel, welcome. Thank you, Simon. It's good to be here. It's great. I mean, I was so surprised that you agreed to do this, bearing in mind the caliber of host and co-host. Um, you're getting a bravery award for this one. You you have another the the two get they're another Thad Montgomery sitting right here. Well, we we and do, and so they're the smartest, smartest men in the room. 
there's absolutely no question about it. Now, and of re- and of late, um, I've got to know um, Ch- uh, Chase Scott from KC Farms, and I've met his wife. I would like to have had Jess on here too, but you know, I know you've got to conquer and divide, right? So uh, perhaps at another opportunity, she can come and join us because I think she's got a great input on on what you guys do as a team. Um, and it's great to see, you know, um, for those that don't know, KC Farms uh, is the only USDA uh, certified processor in the county. Um, the facility is top notch. OK, so we know Chase has dropped a big chunk of change in here. Um, he's got a cattle business. He's got all sorts of things going around, around the farm, all very symbiotic. Uh, and we're looking to develop a lot of relationships with with both of these guys, Daniel and Chase, uh, because they offer the county an opportunity to raise the bar. And that's what this is all about. So, Chase, thank you very much for coming. I appreciate being here. It's great. I think we're going to have a good conversation. I mean, I'm dying to hear really about how you both got started, where the direction um, that you foresee, how how we can help from a community perspective, how perhaps we can get some of the local government to make that an easier transition, you know, um, whether that goes into, I don't know whether it's what, what permits you need or how you operate as a business, um, how, how bureaucratic um, policies impact you, because uh, I'm sure they do. <laughs> In fact, there's no question that they don't. Um, but how we can, you know, we can, we can, we can keep moving forward because what you guys are doing, as far as I can figure out, is you're leading from the front, um, and at that point, you know, um, power to you. I mean, I, 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 I hope every business model um, succeeds when when you're leading from the front. It's a tough place to to be, um, but but you guys are doing it. I used to try and cheat off a of chase in high school, so I know he's he's probably got his stuff in order because if there's anything i know about myself i always knew i picked the smartest ones to cheat off of because basically what you could do is it's a free for all with your sheet you just go in there and find two or three ones you just mark something different you know you're still gonna get an a because he's probably getting a hundred so you just find three of them you just throw it off or whatever but see that that wasn't that wasn't necessarily my fault it's the, the fault of the teachers for not paying i think one of them was mr uh it was english class well, I cannot remember this, Mr. Cooper. Did you ever have him? Yeah. That was one of them then. And this man would sit here and doze off in the middle of class. And the problem, and, and lucky for me, is I sat on the side of the room with all the studious individuals. I was the only. How did they let you do I that? I was the only really? crack up. All the other crack ups were on the other side. So although Mr. Cooper was sitting right here to my, you know, basically my, you know, 11 o'clock. He was laser focused on the other side of the room. The entrance, So much so where I was literally up and just. Doing this right here on people's papers beside Lindsey Purdue. You know, I used to cheat off him all the time. Hey, look, we all find our way some way, shape, or form. And I knew I knew who the smart ones were. So I had some some pretty good credit to be able to figure out whose coattails to ride. But yeah. So I, I just want to say a few things as we're rolling in. Um, Foggy Ridge Cattle Company. Uh we've used Chase a couple times here in the last couple months. Um a lot, the one thing we found a, a lot of our customers are wanting a local so they have somebody they can talk to um they don't like getting something wrong and having to either drive or call somebody that's an hour away and that person doesn't have to look them face to face so they really enjoy that and and the other thing is is it's easier for them to drive and pick it up and then they get to build a relationship with the processor too um that kind of that kind of helps build the community as far as, you know, they, 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 they get to meet Chase, they get to see the facility and understand exactly how clean it is. Um, I'm telling it's, you, it's you're, spotless. you're not going to, you're not going to go to another facility and find one as clean as this one. Um, every time I walk in, I can't find a speck of dirt unless I go out to the outside of it. And that's where the dirt's supposed to be at. But, um, and then the other thing with Daniel, uh, we bought a hog off of you this year, and I'm gonna tell you what, my family really enjoys it. Um, 
I've never I've never processed a hog myself that had that much fat on it. <laughs> Good. I'm uh, glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, the, they're raised right. And uh, you're all non-GMO. That's correct. Yes, sir. Won't you walk us into that? Because a lot of a lot of us farmers around here have a closed mind as to using um, products like such as Roundup for burn down and um, other, you know, GMO beans, Roundup ready corn, Roundup ready beans. It makes it easier to keep your fields cleaner. Um, and and it can be a struggle without, without all those chemicals, can it? So that, Chris, is a um, pretty good can of worms to get started with. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Chris. Yeah, so let's start with that. So, uh, first off, uh, GMO stands for uh, what we're calling a genetically modified organism. And in this case, we are talking about genetically modified corn and genetically modified soybeans. There are various other crops as well. Canola is one, certain tomatoes, uh, and believe it or not, the GMO gene actually started in potatoes, if I have that correct. So it is pretty tough to farm non-GMO, but it's not insurmountable. But the biggest challenge is actually probably between your ears. And so we have to <laughs> delicately put decide that we're going to farm this way. But most importantly, we have to decide why we're going to farm this way. And that can be for a lot of reasons. Uh, economics. It can be for that we would have a belief that maybe GMOs are wrong from syrup, from all sorts of different perspectives. They could be wrong from a uh, moral aspect that man shouldn't be fooling around and inserting things into genes. They can be wrong from a uh, capitalist aspect of that um, entities should not be allowed to own germaplasm, which has never happened before in history until 1994. Elaborate on that one second there, if you would, Daniel. I didn't, I didn't, what, what was the germaplasm? Sorry, that's a, a, a phrase I'm not familiar with. So please understand, Simon, that I know enough things to be dangerous about an, an, to fool some people some of the time and to be extremely dangerous. Okay. okay. So basically un, until um, this GMO thing started, right? And especially in soy. So uh, when soy was introduced into this country and became widespread in the 50s, as uh, modern combine harvesters got better, uh, producers began to use it uh, as the old open pollinated corns fell out of favor. Protein levels started falling in uh, modern hybrids. And so uh, soy was introduced as a protein source okay. rather, rather than uh, animal byproducts or anything like that. And so um, soy was introduced. And uh, universities, land grant universities, would run breeding programs where they would naturally select for whatever trait they wanted. Better standability, higher yield, uh, more even pod shatter, all that kind of thing that makes modern farming what it is. And these universities would develop these hybrids or these uh, crosses of soybeans. I'm sorry, not hybrids, but they would develop these soybean varieties and put them out and then producers could use them. And um, this went on for decades and every community would have someone that was running a seed operation and you would pick your best field of soy and you would combine it and you would take it to your local cleaner and then you would save your own seed. Right. So that's the heirloom seed concept because you can regenerate with the heirloom seed. Basically, yes. OK. Yes. So we're not at this point getting into genetically modified. This is just we're selecting through a certain process which which is natural um the best product that you can get from cross-pollination or whatever it may be so that we should all be fairly okay with that is that not does that have any moral implications it depends on how far you want to go oh well this is where we're going to find where the moral implications become a problem okay so um as things continued um, glyphosate was introduced commercially in this country in 74, I believe, 1974, uh, as a uh, crop herbicide, and it worked marvels. 
it was a uh, one of the top 10 agricultural inventions of the last century. How many people did it kill? Uh, I'm not sure about that. Okay, just I, yeah, I, I was being facetious. Yeah, I don't think any. It was actually introduced as a chelating agent, as a cleaner. I oh, know, I'm sure it was. And so, uh, but this changed the game, okay? Because uh, before this, we were using a lot of contact herbicides that didn't work as well. And we were using soil applied residuals that took a lot longer. So we had a game changer hit and started to change the face of the industry. So mass production. Uh, it made it easier to do. And I promise I'm going somewhere with this. You ask a question. Okay. So um, corn was fairly easy because uh, corn's grown on 30 inch rows. It can be cultivated. It will uh, row over fairly quick, you know, where it covers the ground. But um, weeds were always an issue in soy. In um, 1986, John Deere introduced a no-till drill that took the industry by storm. That was the first one that would actually work well across a lot of different scenarios, dry land, wet land, et cetera. Folks realized that they could plant soybeans with this drill, but then we were still really fighting weed control. So obviously there are uh, some folks um, in, in our society, which in a way we all are in a capitalist society that are in this for the money. Okay. And they figured out like, how do we, what question do we want to solve? How do we want to make someone's life easier? If we could make soy, modern soy resistant to this herbicide, then, okay, that we could the point. clean the soy fields up that and was it the made point. everyone's life miraculously easy. I remember this. I was a young chap. But I remember the first year my dad used Roundup Ready soybeans. It was a miracle. However, but, but when you purchased these miracle seeds, you signed a little form, okay? And in that form, you promised that you would not replant these seeds because soybeans are a variety, not a hybrid. So they'll always seed true. And from 1993 to about 1996, I think like 85% of seed conditioners went out of business. That's bad. I would think so, yes. Because now someone, an entity, now controls the sole seed bank for that product. The first time in human history that mankind has owned seed. germoplasm. Yes. Okay, now I see where, where you're at. That should, that that's the... the that's the, the, the light that is now flashing. There's the alarm bell, 74. Okay. Hmm. That's, that, that's very worrisome in, in how that develops. And, and we can look really at big ag as developing this or universities or combination of the two, I'm sure. But it was certainly supported maybe initially without the damage that it's done or will continue to do. So we may but we we may have been in a a situation where we don't know, but this looks like a great idea. So there may be some innocence behind that, playing devil's advocate. So so Simon the uh, point of this is to stir controversy somewhat. Is that kind of what Oh, I mean? we're great yeah. at that. All right. So I'm going to drop one more bomb and then I'm going to be quiet and put Chase in the hot seat for a second, okay? So the issue is this is that Monsanto be very careful where you use that name around here. Was sold to Bayer, which discontinued Monsanto. It no longer exists. Who owns Bayer? Is that a rhetorical question? I hope it is. Everyone's 401k. Okay. So what, like BlackRock? Those. It's a publicly traded company. BlackRock probably has the majority shares. So. Perhaps. What are you asking from your 401k? Profit. Every time. It's all about bottom line. And that's greed, which is one of the greatest sins. Just mentioning it wow, off that, the bat. That was a bomb. That was a bomb. <laughs> greed is the, is the entity of the, such the, the, the biggest evil that, that we have to cope with in society right now. So we're paying. The root cause is greed, right? We're paying into our 401ks to make a profit. And in doing so, we're paying Bayer to come up with a product. Wow. 
<laughs> wow. Barry, that's the same company with, you know, the medication and stuff, too, right? The big pharmaceutical company. Yeah. Barry so ba- so is so like your number one baby asshole. So the same the same people who are in control, mm. essentially, of the, the food supply are also in control, have a big stake in big pharma. So it's also in their best interest to to feed you things that will have you showing up to see their mm-hmm. doctors. and. But the real issue, at least in my opinion, is the fact that everyone wants Bayer to make money. Boom, I'm going to be, boom, boom, boom. I, you know what? I mean, we could swing around and, and the, the comment there is, did you just see what Daniel did there? Well, I've got uh, a question. Uh, we're talking non-GMO. We're talking Roundup Ready, whatever. And that was hot back when, as you already mentioned, when his dad planted the first thing. And it went several years and everybody thought, well, this is a wonderful but have we have we run a cycle here in which all right let's get closer there you go have we run a cycle here in which i'm not saying it's plateaued but i mean non-gmo is more of a buzzword today than it was eight or nine years ago would you agree or in my world for sure well, yes yeah, but i mean <laughs> i i, I yeah. feel like i pay attention to it and i i feel like it's yeah it's creating i mean it's non is on the rise, would you say? I would. I, I Without would. question. Without yeah. question. Yes, I think so. And a lot yeah. of that's to do with, with stay-at-home moms starting to pay attention to their kids' health. A little bit of pushback. So, yeah. hey, don't know if I like all that or not. But their husbands are paying into the 401k, which is driving the food force that's causing all the medical issues. Well, I'm not going to say all the medical issues, but causing their health issues well the one thing I so like, big pharma now is embedded in big ag is really that's the biggest bomb drop that you've given me and, and let me tell you my heart rate and blood pressure has just gone through the roof with with that bomb drop well let's let's hold on so i i missed the target clearly oh um, so my opinion the real problem is that where we're investing our money and demanding the correct rate of return for our invested money, we're creating this problem ourselves as a society. Like I said, greed, you, didn't, you didn't miss the target. You didn't miss the target at all because I've always said greed has always been the downfall of humanity. And I'm being continually reminded um, that that is in fact the case. Um, wow. I've, 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 uh, well, wow. Wow. Yeah, we're in big trouble. Well, I don't, that's why I don't I don't put into a four hundred one k. I don't I don't ever really have. The main reason being is they tell me it's tied to the stock market. I just it's kind of like well, I, I don't. Well, I, we know I, the stock market is rich, so let, I mean, you know, it that it is what that is. Well, the same thing, you know. I don't I don't think Social Security is going to be around to the end for me. I'm just going to probably end up working until I'm dead, which is fine, you know. But uh, it's not all bad. That's you know, it. You and know it's what? actually biblical. Yeah, I, it's I, mean, biblical. I, I, I think we should. It's, I not, yeah, I it's not the end of the world. I mean, I'm fine with it as long as, as long as you know, I'm I got a roof over my head. I'll be all right. But uh, I just, I'm like, well, why, why put my money into something that somebody else is going to be gambling with that they could lose? I'll just use what I can now, and if I can throw everything I've got now, who knows? Maybe you know, maybe a show will make me enough money to have a little bit put away for retirement someday. You never know. You just keep throwing stuff at the wall. Sometimes something sticks. Sometimes you know, it takes a while. So, 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 get a little more out of chase. Um, I'm sure you can tell the difference between grass fed and grain fed when you're processing, right? I want you to expose this the way you told me about it, um, and 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 you've got a unique perspective of it because you see it, you've seen it, um, and I I I, I get the, f- the flavor profile is down to like beauty's in the eye of the beholder, but I definitely want Chase to come up and say this is the difference between the two. Well, maybe we should ask him, why in the world would you even go to a processing plant? Wait, I mean, you ask him. Yeah, why Why would you start one? What was the What was the idea to having a processing plant, and where can you see it going? On, on, you know, it's, yeah, because most sure. people around here. It's the only door to retail. Yeah. Sure. It's the only door. Exactly. That's it. That's it. Full and- stop. We were, so we're a beef farm, livestock farm, and we've always looked for ways to add value to our cattle. We did that for years 
with selling bulls, seed stock for other farms, purebred registered cattle. That was our focus for years. I'm talking 30 years. And, uh, and that's been fine. That's been good to us. But, uh, my wife and I, we wanted to continue to add value. We felt that we were create, although we were creating really good bulls, really good heifers. We also had this large supply of steers, beef steers that we thought were great genetics. And we were selling them in the mainstream channels that everyone else was. And we thought, you know, we're just really not capturing the value out of these things that is there so you know you just start working through the flow chart how do you do that well mm-hmm. you gotta it's just kind of like car parts you know they're worth more in parts than they are as a whole mm-hmm. so we thought well what would it take to start processing cattle and so that we sell our own meat that that chris that's what got us started on building a processing plant start out of something that we saw of doing just our own but once we got it built um, you get your workforce in place, you got a community needing some services done and we think, okay, well, let's, let's get in here. Let's try to cr- provide a service that's meaningful, valued. And, uh, that started as custom exempt, right? So that was just for shares, not for shares, not for sale. The, 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 the real thing there, that's, that's processing meat for the owner of the animal. That's how that works. And we started out that way. We always had an idea that we were going to go USDA inspection, and we have. And what that allows us to do is to process meat that can be sold for retail in any venue because it's processed under the inspection of the USDA. And so whether you like that system or not, and I understand the necessity for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, Let me ask you this. Go on. You, th- this is my. I just took over this show. I, I believe you did. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I brought I him in Simon. first earlier. That's why I had to bring him uh, in first. It's okay, Billy. I, I'm not intimidated. So, so what's what is the difference between because when you were processing for custom, you had to be state inspected, right? The facility is inspected, right? All right. So, what else is added to having USDA? So a, a lot of the customers, they see that, that, that price tag between USDA and custom. Yeah. So can you walk can you walk us through what else is added? As, I mean, because it has to be an additional cost. Sure. Can you walk us through those? The biggest, I, I would say, layer that is added with USDA meat processing is the inspector is on site. And, and the purpose of that, is they inspect every live animal looking for disease or sickness to make sure, okay, we're starting out with what looks like a, a good, healthy animal, wholesome. And then uh, they they watch us harvest the animal, kill the animal, to make sure we haven't done anything terrible or egregious. You know, they're trying to uh, make sure there's no animal cruelty going H- on. Humanely. Humane handling yeah, is what they call exactly. that. Quite right. And so they're there and, you know, in a shop like mine where it's just me and my, our, uh, our staff, we do things right no matter what. So that's not an issue. But I can imagine in a big plant there could be opportunities for animal cruelty. And so that's, that's another reason they're there. And then, uh, and then also they do a post-mortem inspection of the animal again, making sure that we're starting out with a pretty healthy, fit animal that's going to enter the food chain for human consumption. That that's, that's the big difference between the two. Um, we run our operation the same, whether we're doing custom exempt or USDA. I mean, right, no difference. Same system. Uh, other than you have a USDA representative doing those checks. Yes. That the animals walking in under its own steam. Yes. There's one thing I noticed, um, on something I, I saw from the UK. Um, and I'm sure they do the same thing here. I'd be very surprised if they didn't. Um, was with, uh, and it was referring to a uh, it was a lamb that had been harvested, and the the butcher was there and was showing me um, the kidney, mm-hmm. and that there had been an incision in the kidney by the inspector. This is in the UK, yeah. Um, to to check for disease in the kidney, and that that to me was oh wow. I thought the the USDA guys being the equivalent 
And I, I, I kind of crossed it with, is it UK, is it US? Uh, anyway, whatever. I was wondering if they went to the same extent um, with that level of inspection with the the organs to check for disease. They sure do. Uh, and that's they, great to know. They spend a lot of time on lip notes because that's where that disease is going to show up. Yeah. I mean, BSE was a big thing in the UK. We know it's made its way here uh, in one way, shape, or form. Um, and, and that was probably bad feed practices from from the farmer, almost certainly. Um, so the fact that, you know, we're now seeing USDA, and I, I, I was under the misconception, rightly or wrongly, that, you know, the USDA guy was there with his clipboard, here's cow so-and-so, so-and-so number, blah, blah, blah. Yes, he's walking in under his own steam. He's been uh, he's been dispatched humanely, and that was it. But there's actually a lot more to the USDA inspection than we all yeah. are, are aware of um, to make sure that, that we are ingesting a, a healthy animal. And here's a scenario, right? If, if, if they're doing this inspection and they find some area, be it the lungs, kidney, or somewhere that's abnormal, mm -hmm. Uh, that would indicate the animal had been sick, then they'll do an antibiotic test. And the reason for that is, is, okay, well, what if someone had a, had an animal that wasn't up to par and said, okay, we're going to treat the animal, okay? Has and, it flushed that antibiotic and they, out? And they treated the animal, and through some mistake, it became it came into slaughter. If If that animal had been given a certain class of antibiotic, and then it ended up in some... But who it, was allergic to that animal? It's now in the food chain. It created I issue. Get it. And so, real simple. If they see that the animal has any abnormal, they say, "Hey, let's just." They have a. They do the testing. They take care of that. They'll say, "Okay, Chase, this is retained, and a retained animal. It might be one hour, two hours, whatever comes back." And they'll say, "Okay, it's cleared." So that's that's a big piece of that inspection. You know, and that that you don't get with necessarily the custom even though you're in the same facility. Because that's going to one household, exactly. generally. Yeah. Uh, with the with the USDA inspection, goodness, I mean, that could be going to 100 going anyway. or 200 households very quickly. I'm, I'm uh, you know, the, the, the more I get into this, the more I appreciate where we get our food from. Um, and, and that's really the message behind this whole community um, push is know where your food has come from. And the fact that it's got a USDA stamp um, gives you uh, certainly, in, in, in my <clears throat> mind, you know, I've got, I've got no issues here. This, this, this isn't just, he walks into the abattoir, boom, got the, the nail gun or whatever it may be. <laughs> That's not the case. They are looking deep into these animals uh, for our benefit. Hmm. And, I, and, I, and I'm okay with that. I do it for their benefit. Well, but you've also you've also also got to consider when you're retailing to the general public, you've got to have a standard, and this well, is probably one of the only ways in which we can do it. Well, you could, but the standard could be instead of you know, Mister, steal your income to pay my income tax man, who it's in his best interest to go out there, no matter how clean the farm is, no matter how perfect the farmer did his job, it's always in his interest to go out there and find something wrong. It's like he's road pirate state DOT guys. If, if everything was perfect and everything was passing, well, then they, well, we, what do we need you for? Well, no, that's, day, that's, that's not how that goes. But that's we not really, how that works. We really don't need them because at the end of the day, you, you trust your meat to send out. You don't need a man with a badge sitting there telling you that otherwise, you know, better than anybody else. So, if anybody else doesn't trust Chase, then perhaps there could be a, a you know a, a third party individual who is paid to come in here and he inspects. And that way, if something's wrong with it, it falls back on him. It might fall back on Chase. But at the end of the day, they're not having to spend all this extra money on regulations and jumping prices. So if you pay an extra you know dollar for that stamp, well you know cut off fifty percent of it. You make you know an extra fifty cent, and you're not having to pay the middleman. I, I wish it was that. I wish it was that cut and dry but, well, no, it, but, but i don't think not, it is but it should be like you should be able to i mean we've got yelp today i guarantee you if you sell a bad batch of meat by next week everybody and their cousin around here is going to know about it and they're going to be questioning it and they're going to be calling you up you know i can understand maybe some of these 
regulations a hundred years ago, where it might take you a month to get a letter from here to Southwest Virginia or 150 years ago, something like that. But in the technology age we're in right now, you you can find that, you know, if, if somebody's going to get sick, it's, everybody's going to know about it instantaneously. You know, you can go on Yelp and be like, have a, have a review for local farms. We'll chase this farm right here 100%. Everybody goes through there. Everything's clean. Well, this guy over here, he's had 17 different, you know, violate. I think, I think we could choose ourselves if we could just get away from this. And I know this is bigger than what we're going to talk about here today, but people just pull their heads out of their asses and get back to using common sense. I think we can start. Well, that's I, I I get that argument, I really do. But the the more I've got into um into into depth on this subject, I appreciate the the USDA inspection because there are I and 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 they are, they are far and few between. But there are the unscrupulous farmers, um, and when you look at how some of these massive cattle herds are dealt with, you, you would probably be well, I, more encouraged to deal with a smaller producer in a local environment, which is what I'm saying is a good thing. Well, you look what, at how what many you people buy, are allergic to well, penicillin. But, but what? You, well, I mean, well, of course. But what and, you buy in the in in the market? Now, I've done this taste test. I bought some stuff from a big box store. I'm not going to start snagging names or anything. It was down the road here. And I thought, oh, this is a USDA piece of beef, and, and, and it looked good. The marbling was there. The color wasn't quite as blush and red as I was hoping, but it still looked good, and it tasted as bland as hell. And then when I've had local beef, that flavor profile is completely different. It's completely different. I had some of Chase's ground beef that had the, 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 the perfect content of fat and meat and and to make a burger with it, I knew the difference. I couldn't replicate that with store bought meat. I couldn't do it. Well, so you, that's, you can't patty out a third pound of burger out of store hamburger. And you can't get, do it. Get a true. You, third you pound can't do it. it. So I'm really advertising the fact that you know buying local produce is definitely the way to go, and supporting all our local farmers is definitely the way to go. But I still think the USDA. It, it, as 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 much as you hate the entity, and and trust me, I do too. Um, there is a necessity for standard operating procedures when you're dealing with a retail market that isn't just a local market. Oh, I'm not disagreeing with you. There should be standards. I just think the people calling their shots should be taken out back and dealt with, and then have people with common sense in those positions, because I think that's where we're falling off. We're paying, well, I think you, we're paying middlemen who don't know what the hell they're doing. And I'm not saying that's every single one of them, but and I'm not saying that's ones around here, but at the end of the day, they're government employees. Come on. Let's just, well, you know, at, at what point? At what point? Because I could swing around and go, I'll buy some of Chase's or, or, or Chris's custom uh, cut meat. I bought a share. I've bought half a side of beef. And I want you guys to do whatever. I'm, I'm happy in my mind knowing that I can do that. Okay. That option is there available for me. Okay. I can do it. I have a generator. Okay. I, I can put that meat in a freezer. I can I can freeze it on bulk where I'm not, you know, at risk of losing it with an AEP power outage that <laughs> seems to happen or a brownout that seems to happen quite a lot. Um, I'm happy to do the, 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 the quarter, half share whatever i'm not bothered about it but the retail market needs a higher standard and i get it i hate it well, but the retail like, market needs yeah, a higher standard that's just like but i'd like to hear rate. it's the same as cream. yeah Absolutely. just like the cream I want to go down a rabbit hole is that permissible come on go for yeah. it we do rabbit holes here yeah. all day long. so here we go we ready go all right so um for me personally one of the things that helps me understand life better is this concept called start with why. So there's an author and a speaker named Simon Sinek that done a fairly popular Ted talk and wrote a book called start with why. So if we use that concept and go into Chase's dealing with the USDA inspector, I would recommend a book called the jungle by an author named Upton Sinclair. Has anyone ever heard of it? Yeah. Okay. This particular author, I think it was written in 1903 wrote this book about labor conditions in the meatpacking industry in Chicago. Shocking. And he said later that he aimed for their heart and he missed and he hit them in their stomach. 
I wouldn't recommend that you read it any time before you're going to sit down to a meal. Pretty grim reading. Now, here is the real problem, or the real solution, in my opinion. And I have a fairly small view of the world. But the real issue is that if we all buy beef from Chase, and he decides that it doesn't need to be refrigerated, then we would probably all get sick, and we probably would no longer buy meat from Chase. Supply and demand. Simple as that. And then Chase would either decide that we're wrong or he's wrong. And I think too much on my side of the fence in production agriculture, what happens is, is that we assume that someone else will shoulder the responsibility. Nail on the head. Nail on the head. So thank you for that rabbit trail. That was a good one. What do you think, Chase? I mean, because I know you've got to have um, a, a very healthy relationship. Um, with the USDA, the USDA inspectors and how you get them on site to do the inspections during certain kill, kill, kill days that, you know, require those inspectors. So you, you have to develop a relationship with them. Um, how's that going? Oh, it's fine. <clears throat> I would say there's a handful of states, uh, well, maybe it's a dozen or so, that have agreements with the USDA in that, our state inspectors actually can do the USDA inspection for us. And Virginia is one of those states. And the good thing about that is you're working with local people who have just, they went through the training with USDA and said, yeah, you know, y'all know what you need to look at. Y'all know how to do it. Y'all, y'all go represent us. And so I feel very lucky that Virginia's done that. That's and a good move. It's a good move. Definitely. Good move. And so we work with, uh, the Virginia department of ag, does our USDA inspection and, uh, all those people has been pretty good resources for us. Uh, you know, I, I'll be honest when we leading up to it, I had a lot of anxiety about it. I thought this is just going to suck. You know, this is going to be bad, but, uh, I can't, I can't even call a, a scenario that we couldn't work through. Um, and they've become, and of course I'm pretty new at this, Billy. Um, I feel like they're getting more and more efficient. For example, our normal inspector uh, will also work regularly with three or four other facilities to try to be efficient with time. Uh, Once that animal is branded, inspected, then when we roll it out to be fabricated or cut up, good to go. That's not, they don't necessarily feel like they have to be looking over your shoulder every second of that. So they've gotten pretty efficient about that. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the regulation that we have in this country. And I don't know, we, 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 we we've been able to deal with it. Uh, it, it hasn't, I have to say it hasn't been overburdensome is what I would say. What is your, your thought process on, I'll, I'll, I'll make one statement and then come on to this question. We do not want to have a situation in this country where we have a BSE problem. I was living in the UK when that hit, and um, it, it was a nightmare. Um, and thankfully, it did expose some very poor practices. So, and I'll leave that one alone. But that's that's one thing we definitely do not want here: is a foot and mouth, a BSE issue, um, and and it, and if the USDA can 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 work you know towards that as a goal they're on the right track um but what would you say the difference between if i bought and and i'm not looking for anything specific i'm gonna pin you down on this because that would be a dirty trick if i bought and i'll make it easy by saying half a side as a share Mm -hmm. um and i said right i want to i'd like you to butcher it this way and i get x amount packaged butchered beautiful if it's usda inspected and and the same deal roughly what percentage more would i be looking to pay because it's usda inspected and i I, it's not a trick question um you know it might be five percent seven percent hopefully it's not twenty percent but you know the usda inspector has has a price element to it i'm just hoping it's not a crippling price element because we all want to be able to get local products, which is what we're looking to explore with the farm to table at the Morris Hotel, is local products with a USDA stamp 
in a retail environment that the local people can actually, you know, take advantage of. Mm-hmm. So I'm just, I'm slightly intrigued as to the, 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 the cost difference if we had a half a side of beef and a half a side of beef. I'm not asking you to be deadly accurate because I'll never hold you to it. But I, I'm slightly intrigued as to what that cost difference would be. Do you think 10%? Mm. I mean, it's not it's not an easy... I mean, I, I, did, I didn't want to jump on you with that question. I'm not looking to put you in an no. awkward position at all. But I'm just intrigued as to what that inspection percentage relates to to get a specific... Not necessarily because then we're dealing with cuts of meat, so it's very difficult to actually assess. Yeah, it really is. It really because, is because because it's it's you're looking at a whole share exactly versus and, all these retail cuts, and then, and, and also the other thing that changes yeah. is the labeling requirements that has to right. go along. So with there's the so much it's, more it's involved. A whole lot to, you know what? That's not an apples for apples question. Yeah. I'm going to withdraw that question because it's not a fair question because I understand. It's not a re- it, the retail and share is a very different animal, so I get it. I'm going to withdraw that question because it, it it's not a fair comparison. So as a as a producer myself, both of these gentlemen in here I use on a regular basis. Not Chase, not quite so much because we're not a we're not around. You know, we're we're just now establishing our USDA product, trying to get it out um but we actually switched about a year ago to daniel's non-gmo feed um so we've been buying feed from daniel and we've been using chase um so these two guys right here i try and have a pretty good relationship you know the feed man that way when i run out on the weekend i can say hey man is there any way i can squeeze a load of feed in (laughs) and the process man hey i got one that's that's pretty close. Can we go ahead and send him on? Um, but for Chase, I know there's a difference in grass fed and grain fed. Um, my brother in law and I discovered that this year. I can't stand the taste of grass fed. Um, and he thinks it's the best thing ever. Um, Beauty's in the eye of the beholder. That's right. Well, that's always going to be the case, mate. You're going to run into but, that no matter what. But I, th- I also think that our taste buds have been conditioned over the years t- yes, to, look, to look for that little bit of a sweeter flavor. Um, I, no, I wouldn't deny that. I think that's absolutely the case. We've, we've been addicted to a corn-finished, grain-finished animal, and that's not a bad thing. That's it. I don't think that's a bad thing. Can you, can you see a noticeably difference between... Between grass finish, one that's like GMO finish, and one that's non-GMO, can you tell a difference when you're processing? I'm not sure about the non-GMO versus GMO difference. Yeah. I mean, you're going to struggle. I, with I it. just want to. I don't. I don't. I, yeah, and I'm not sure I've seen enough to really make a comparison. Yeah, but I can tell you, uh, when we when we do a gra- a grain finish steer. At 9 a.m. and then a grass finished deer at 10:30 a.m. Then you know it's a lot of difference. It's but the the animals have been treated so differently. Their diet's been so different. It should be different. Yeah. Oh yeah. The, yeah. The, the texture you, of the meat. The you firmness should, you of the should meat. expect a different flavor profile. Yeah. If you're not getting a different flavor profile, well, something's horribly wrong. Yeah. And and which one's better? I, I don't know. The beauty's in the eye exactly. of the beholder. I mean, some some people want salmon tonight, and some people some people want a pork chop. I mean, you know, we don't eat the same thing every th- every night for supper. Now, have you ever heard of anybody? I, I I can't remember somebody around here told me or I read it somewhere, but some people will go off and they'll they'll pull up the grain from these breweries or whatnot, and they'll feed their cattle that stuff the last thirty days before they take them to the slaughterhouse, and apparently it gives the beef kind of a one of those kind of deals, like I know certain, that's a thing. I know certain people have used brewers' um, it's called grain, grain. The, yeah, the brewers' grain for their hogs, but I don't know about cattle. I mean, apparently it gives them. I, I don't know. You it, can use brewers' grain for cattle. Um, there was a dairy farmer. He went out two, three years ago up on Bethlehem, and he used brewers' grain. Um, and you talking about pumping some milk out of cows? Um, 
it's it's I don't really know how to explain it because I don't understand the science behind the protein and the fermentation and all of that. But he had some of the best milk and breed of, a breed of cows that don't produce that don't generally produce a high quantity of milk, pumping out good good quantities every time. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's all different things you. Canola, you can play around with your canola, the wheat mids. Um, the possibilities are endless. Well, they're all byproducts. Yeah. Beer, beer's grains or distiller grains. And even though some nutrients have been extracted, it still has some nutrients in it mm-hmm. to be used. It's I know my, my great-grandfather would used to turn out his hogs into the apple orchard with the fallen apples and watch his hogs get drunk as skunks. <laughs> On on you know apples that were somewhat loaded with sugar and so you used to get it through your rum and your and your sausage. Well, that was my great grandfather. So I <laughs> thankfully I I wasn't there for that one. But uh, you know I've heard a number of stories about hogs in apple orchards. So Dan, you said something while ago, and and I was thinking about it, and I can't exactly remember what you said, but you said the. We, we we as farmers assume that somebody else will take the responsibility. I did say that, and I believe that, yes. And so what, what I feel like, um, and this is my personal belief, but I believe that the basis of human existence is relationships between each other. And when we put, uh, just to use this for example, but when I buy your beef, Chase is between you and I now. Mm-hmm. So if I have a quality problem, it's Chase's fault first, not yours. And in this scenario, I don't think that would ever happen because you're sending individual animals to Chase who is cutting them to order for either me or you to sell to me as a cut. But if you ship four tractor trailer loads a day, okay, then you're selling them to a packer who now assumes all responsibility. And then the packer is selling them to a retailer who then assumes all responsibility. And after three or four layers of this, the personal connection it's gone. Is gone. Oh, it's yeah. gone. It's gone. We we need to reestablish the public's relationship with the producer. And this is what we've been trying to do ad infinitum on this show. I think for a certain uh I think stay local Franklin County has, has gone has taken great strides in looking to do that. Um in in allowing people to explore that option um but this this is this is this is my whole thought process here is to get our local producers and our local residents in that symbiotic relationship and and you know that's what we have to succeed at we have to succeed at it um because they will be so much better off uh and 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 nutrition is is behind wellness and if we don't acknowledge that then you you know what keep going up to the big box stores and buying the garbage because i can't help you but if we're buying nutrition and we're buying locally with local producers um we're in the best place that we can possibly be you know um and 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 i'm going to keep pushing that um you know until i drop dead well i think it's encouraging it's working I think it is. I think it's working. I think I mean, it is. Versus when I was a child or when you was a child, there's more opportunities for local stuff than it was then. So, I mean, I yeah. think it's, uh, we're definitely not losing ground. No. I know we're, we're looking we're to make it up. In, we're headed in a good direction. It's almost full circle. because Isn't that crazy? We're, we're, we're far enough now that, you know, your great-grandfather raised hogs, right, Simon? Okay. Uh-huh. And that's not really the Simon that I know. Right, right. And that would not be your career path. Through no, it wouldn't life, be is... mine. He was also he also owned the local pub in North Devon. So there's a number of stories there could I could explore, <laughs> but we'll leave those well alone. <laughs> and so what happens is is that uh, a generation or two back, everyone lived on the land, yes, or had a close connection to the land, and so they had a relationship. And then as we've become more and more specialized, we've lost all this. And does anyone remember COVID-19, 
and supply chain disruptions and issues. That's why I feel like that this is coming full circle and is gaining ground, if you will, and gathering. The, the traction behind what we're looking to do here with local farmers, local producers, having USDA products from local producers readily available to the population of Franklin County is where we need to be. And we're gonna, but we are gonna get there. So let me hit you with this. Uh oh. So you USDA is a government entity, to a degree. To a degree. Well, right. actually, because the Virginia no, situation it is definitely is a government entity. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a government a entity. Of government, federal. Yep. Yep. So, so this Food this is a rabbit hole. This is a rabbit hole. So Bill Gates owns what eighty some percent, seventy five percent of the farmland. In the U.S.? No, it's not, it's not that much, but he owns an enormous amount. But for what purpose, I do he not know. the most. Yeah. All right. So this is a rabbit hole. I'm, oh, yeah. I'm so, well di- so just imagine, so most of his stuff is, what, Midwest? West? Probably probably west of the Mississippi. True yeah. true cattle country. Yeah. West of the Mississippi, Mississippi I agree. So the U- so yeah. This is definitely a rabbit hole. <laughs> so they decided to shut all the farms down out there. Who are they? Well, Bill Gates, the government, whoever he's in bed with. Ain't going to happen. Why? They could shut it down. They could say we're not shipping. People won't allow it. You don't think so? Nope. So even if they don't ship it, then even if they continue to ship it and people need to buy it and... They say, well, it, we, we're, the USDA is no longer inspecting, so you can't sell it through the stores to to the public. Then it will go underground. That's okay. That's okay, too. That, that's you, a, you, who, you have to feed a population with quality, and we will go underground if you think that that is a game you're going to play. And I'm not a big conspiracy theory when it comes to that element of government. Don't get me wrong. I despise government. I, I think they are thieves and vagabonds, and I'll leave it at that. But we we will always overcome the ability to feed our families because that's what we're on the planet for. That's what we do this for. We feed our families. Well, I think a good way for people to kind of understand is also a good way to educate them. So for a lot of the people on here that are listening, maybe it's your first time tuning into an episode we've talked about stuff like this. I know if you go back and listen to – our Appalachian Farmer episodes, the first couple parts, and the, uh, the episode on what you eat, both phenomenal. But, you know, as time goes, we also gain new new listeners and new things. So I, for, for the common person, they're walking into Kroger. They walk down the, the meat aisle, and they see those big old tubes of three pounds of meat, and they see those big marble shining ribeyes sitting there and, and all this kind of stuff. Now, when you get a share or you buy locally, you're not getting – the same results for one you take that three pounds of hamburger and if you fry it all up at the end you probably got two pounds it just shrinks down and you do that with, well it's already we, sold with a 15 percent water content advertised well that, that's what i want them to explain i want them to explain what it is about that whole process that makes those steaks look bigger that makes those chicken breasts bigger than you know than what you're normally gonna see they use color how can you put color in salmon? Salmon's already got color. So when I see color added, I don't buy it. It's that simple. I'm going to buy local. That's all I'm doing. So when Figure you, it out. So when you buy, we'll just go off a whole animal. So when you buy a whole animal from me, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go to Chase's on a, on a Tuesday night or a Wednesday morning. That's when he tells me to have them there, have them mm-hmm. here by Wednesday morning, 7 o'clock. And most of the time I try to take them Tuesday night because my 7 o'clock generally turn into about 8 o'clock. It's just how it is. Um, I'll be late to my own funeral. But uh, <clears throat> so Chase is going to bring it in his facility, and he's going he's gonna to start a process. And, and his harvest floor is, is already chilling down. So as soon as the animal hits the ground, he starts skinning it. It's already starting to cool, and then it's going to go to a. It's going to go to a. Uh, you have a cool down box, right? Mm-hmm. Before it goes to the freezer, That's right? Chill, uh, chill cooler, chiller, and then you have the actual like cooler, cooler, holding cooler, holding yeah. cooler, and so and that and that's a process of what 
45 minutes. From chill cooler? Well, from, from the harvest floor to the chiller. Yeah, 45 minutes. 45 minutes. And then from the chiller to the the oh, hold cooler. 20 hours. We'll put it in the chill cooler and let it hang there overnight. Lose some moisture. Drip off nice. And then it's going to hang in your hold cooler 14 days. Generally. Generally. Yeah. Unless I, I sweet talk you and you can hang it a couple more or something like that. Right. So, so, and then he's going to process it. So in a matter of two weeks, you're going to have beef that, that, that come right off my farm, went to chase and is, in a matter of two weeks is in your freezer. What's the average time that meat you buy from a store from the time it goes to the, to the harvest floor, the time it hits your freezer? That's a toughie. I've got no idea. But Furthermore, how many times has it been thawed and froze? Thawed and froze, thawed and froze. I, I can tell the only thing I can tell you is my taste test with the big box store and locally produced beef. And I had locally produ- produced beef from from Froggy Ridge, and I've I've had it from uh, KC Farms. You are a traitor. Oh, you turn a, what, that's what red coats do, mate. He's a foodie. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But I've done that taste test. And when, when I, or you, or just look at the color of the meat. Oh, yeah. Look at the marbling and then do that taste test. And I, I dare everyone to go and do it. Go and buy a steak from Casey Farms. Go and buy a steak from Foggy Ridge. And then buy the same steak. Same steak. If it's a sirloin, great. If it's a ribeye, whatever it may be. Same for same. Apples for apples. Oranges for oranges. Do the same grill process, and I guarantee you your flavor profile from the locally produced meat from these two guys at this table is so superior. It is so... It, it, we know where it's come from. Well, Chase is not adding water to my ground beef either. Well, yeah, so that right there. So, I mean, so how do they get away with that? What exactly is that? Why is it that you get three pounds of beef at Kroger, it's going to be two when you get done frying it, but if I get three pounds from y'all... It's going to be three when I get, you know what I mean? Like the burgers are going to stay the same. Like how do they get away with? Well, no, the, the, you've got to, you've, you've, you've got to be a little bit cautious with that statement. The, 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 that was just a the, question. The, I made no well, statements. no, the, 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 the fat content in your burger meat needs to be a certain amount. If you've got lean burger meat, you've bought the wrong burger meat, right? It needs fat content, fat content, the right fat content gives you that flavor profile that we're all looking for, the juicy, moist, uh, medium-rare burger, um, off-the-chart good, right? There's nothing you can do wrong with it. You can put put your own flavors on there, do whatever, but you cannot mess it up. The stuff that is dry, it's got no fat content, it's lean as hell, makes the crappiest burger that you could possibly imagine. By cooking it, you are rendering that fat out Okay, and adding that flavor into that beef, and that's a foodie. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how you do it. Don't buy lean burgers. You, I mean, you know, so you are going to get a certain amount of reduction when you're making a burger. But it's that, extreme. That's, that, that fat is rendering. But it's extreme you, from the box stores, though, is what oh, I'm yeah. saying. Well, when you've got 15% or whatever it may be is... 15% water added. Well, see, how the, but my question is, how do they get away with that? Because essentially at the end of the day, you know, that that's deterring people from coming and spending money with you all. Cause in their mind, they're saying, well, wow, this is three pounds of, of beef in a tube. It's only nine ninety nine. When essentially they're really not, you know what I mean? They're getting, they're, they're being, it's poor quality. Exactly. The, the quality is garbage. The taste profile is garbage. The meat cuts that went into that, and what they've done to stretch it, to make it cheaper, is what's creating what you're what you're explaining. Of what I don't end up with the same burger I do when I buy the local. Um, the cuts that that we'll take and turn in the burger is from just good animals, great animals, uh, locally raised animals. The big box stores ground beef. They, yeah, that's the reason they run it two three dollars a pound. Is it's lower quality cuts, lower quality animals. And then they've amended it somewhat to stretch that volume and make it go further. They may they may, may wash it. They may ammonia wash it. I, I got something I need to say to Chase right quick. 
God, you know it's an open mic moment. <laughs> she may not have been a poor quality animal before she met the livestock trailer. She, she, she may be one of the best producing dairy cows that a farmer ever had. Uh oh. <laughs> but but what I'm saying is, yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, on average, two two and a half years old beef, what we're raising. Yeah, yeah, and and, and most ninety percent of the hamburger you're gonna buy at a big box store is at least six to six eight, to eight, eight years, years old. old. Yeah, so you've already got an animal beyond its prime. Well, and then you've got well, the worst cuts that, going into that. That product. wasn't her. That wasn't her intended purpose. No, of course it wasn't. But she's being utilized. Yeah. And, right, I, and, and I get that. Wrong. I get yeah. that. That's that's not wrong. Now, Jess and I have had a conversation about how do you utilize the the um, ewes yeah. that really are beyond um, putting out as lamb and then mutton. Right now, mutton is is only open to certain palates. Is that's that, for sure. Is that the things Billy's got on his face? <laughs> That's a very touche. <laughs> Give me some. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So when you're talking about the age of the animal, they're at their prime. Anything that goes beyond that age, they're not at their prime. So what do you think you're going to get? Less than prime when it comes to flavor profile. Of course it is. Yeah. Of yeah. course it is. Well, you're not going to get a good steak out of a seven-year-old dairy cow. Disagree. Um, huh? Disagree. Disagree? Yes. Oh, yeah. let's have your input um so if if uh this is my opinion only okay the best steak comes from a mature animal that has exercised that muscle longer best steak i would say dry age it <laughs> now when you dry age a a prime animal that the dry aged profile flavor profile <laughs> is is significantly different absolutely um now and we're looking we're looking i think to expose that at that farm to table store that's going to go into the morris hotel um and we're going to do that with the guys around this table chase what's your opinion on that because that's right no no steak or old because that 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 caught me plumb off guard but you've had experience of that Daniel. So, I mean, share your experience. Yeah, you got an animal. Go ahead and lay that out. I mean, what was that animal? Milk cow or? Uh, six, I believe, year old range cow. <coughs> okay. A what? A six year old range cow. So it would be out of a brood herd. Okay. That would be raised on a brittle environment. So rainfall less than 20 inches a year. So the forage is higher quality. Uh, the cow would have been uh, walking a lot. So exercising a lot. Um, even different than our climate here. You and, sure you just wasn't real hungry? And prepared <laughs> superbly. Well, Whoever that, was preparing it, that, that's the trick. That's it. That's, that's the it. trick. Yeah. A lot of people overcook their meat, mm-hmm. and and that'll ruin a great animal's steak. It'll, it'll, ru- it'll ruin pork. You overcook pork? I'm telling you now, you've done it a greatest injustice by cooking it too much now i will i will agree with you i think there's a difference between a two-year-old that's been on a feedlot and a two-year-old that's like how i mean man, we're basically the same operation somewhat different different styles of going about it but you know we're more of a feedlot setup but it's not i mean they're access to pasture all the time and i, I don't know how i we don't have 200 acres with 40 cows grazing. We have 15 with 15 acres with 15 cows or so. So, and, and we grain them every day. Um, but they're always walking. I mean, and when you're on a feedlot, the only thing you're doing is standing still. You're not really exercising it. So that, that's what kind of took me sideways when you said that. Cause I was like, wait a minute. But I, yeah. I see that exercising the muscles. The, I mean, this would be my opinion only, of course. But the real issue is this concept um, of this idea of food culture. So, um, you know what? 
it's it's very interesting to me, like the amount of diet books and and diet things that are sold. And how did human beings survive before we had this? And I remember in my lifetime, I have seen, uh, you know, first my mother and now my wife, they have changed their cooking styles multiple times. And before that, an area was adapted for generations to make the absolute best of what their area would produce. And then as we become more connected and more, we have more money, then uh, intelligent guys like Simon become foodies, <laughs> right? And they enjoy something called Virginia ham. <laughs> and if I've got this right, uh, a Virginia ham, according to state legislation, has to be hung for at least a year and a day. And it's supposed to be raised on peanuts. Okay, now, well, why this is news to me. would they do that? Now, this has been passed years ago, and I think it's kind of ignored. Okay, but now why would they do that? So if you study, like if you study kind of the science behind it, or the reasoning behind it, we are just cold enough, but not too cold. And we're just hot enough, but not too hot for the cure to be able to be pulled into the meat. Okay. And then not only that, but when you feed hogs peanuts, it makes the fat soft. So it's terrible for sausage making, which why we don't have Virginia sausage but it's perfect for making hams. Okay, so I'm assuming when um, you know when we started really focusing on Virginia hams in about 1815 that they were interested in producing you know a really high quality foodie item. Yeah, right. They were trying to survive. It's what worked here. They wanted the Lord, so they when wanted, they canned, they used the or I guess canned. But when they use Lord, you can you can take a chunk of meat and cook it, put it in a put it in a glass jar, and pour that excess Lord. Over top of it, and it'll set on the shelf for what two years for 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 food preservation. Yeah. So that's that's what we have lost somewhat, and that's part of going back to local. Is what is the food culture in an area? Why why was this thing associated with this place? Well, you've got to look at what what the the big box stores present because they're not presenting um, certain cuts of meat that require slow cooking. It's all about, it needs to go on the barbecue. Boom. Instant gratification. Off you go. Now, we all know around this table that certain cuts of meat require a Dutch oven or a slow cooker. And 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 from four or five hours of, of slow cooking, the flavors you get from that far exceed that rapid approach to, it's got great marbling, Snap it on the barbecue. It's fantastic. Certain cuts cannot do that. And we need to educate the population about the cuts of meat that may not be readily available in the big box stores. And again, I'm going to go back to oxtails, um, shanks, Cheek meat. shoulder meat for lamb. You've got to slow cook it. You cannot roast that and expect the same result from cooking a leg of lamb. You're not going to get the same result. You slow cook a shoulder. You can roast a leg. You cannot do that reverse. So, you know, we're, we're talking about cooking techniques that vary across the whole carcass of the animal. And we've lost that because those cuts of meat are not presented in the big box stores. So we've lost the ability to cook a flavorsome cut and cheap, often cheap cut of meat and come out with a better result. So we've got to educate, you know, folks about the recipes that do work for the, 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 the cheaper cuts of meat that then can actually become, if you cook them correctly, superior to those prime cuts. And that ability requires a little bit of education, but it's not hard. It really isn't. And there, I, there I, I, I leave it at that because it's those cheaper cuts of meat that, should be attracting, we should be able to attract the cheaper cuts of meat to the local populace because, you know, we are in a poor air area of Virginia um, and, and those cuts of meat should be readily available to that environment, to that purchaser. They're not, but when you buy local, they are. So when you end up going through a USDA process and we come up with these beautiful shanks 
um, short ribs, whatever it may be that require a slower cooking process. That's an education process that, that, that we have to educate our purchaser um, because if they're going to do it the old-fashioned way, go, oh, we're just going to throw that in a roast or we're going to throw that on the barbecue. Oh, dear Lord, you're in for a surprise because it, and it ain't going to be a good one. But if you cook it right, we're good to go. I can, I can, and I'm looking to do that with the cook-off, is to come up with the less presented cuts of meat that are going to blow your socks off because it's been cooked correctly. So you cannot cook the whole carcass in the same manner if you're presented with certain cuts from that carcass. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy, folks. <laughs> yeah. You know, we can do this. And that's a, that's a case of education because then your money is working for you. It may take you a little bit longer to cook, but the flavour that you can get from it done the right way is the same as if you paid the big bucks for the prime cuts, but you've paid less for it. There's a win-win. You know, that's just an education process. And I, and I think as as producers and, and retailers, I think we can do, I think we can achieve that and give someone really good value for money. But then we can also swing around and say, well, we're going to dry age some stuff as well. Now, dry aging, let me tell you, it's going to cost you. Offer it all. And I, I, we can do that now. We've got a USDA facility. We've got producers that produce grain-fed, not always non-GMO fed, you can have grass fed, grass finished, grass fed, grain finished. We can we can offer that whole gamut of products. We just got to educate our, our our folks locally in 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 how to present that on a family plate, and it's really easy. It's well, really easy. Well, I, I mean, maybe a genius idea right here. We can do cooking with Simon, put it on YouTube or whatever, and have him take these certain quality of meats. He can have a little rum drink right there, and he's kind of going through the process. Well. Uh, good, good day, everyone. This is how we take a rack of lamb and yeah, get who, these little spices yeah, who, here. Who was that old woman, that uh, the, the British uh, cook? Oh, what was it? Fanny Craddock. Oh, come on now. It was Fanny Craddock. She was a, an old an old lady that done it, that did a cooking show and did books and what have you in the UK. I that mean, she be was you. a classic. Oh, oh no. <laughs> I've just <laughs> fallen into your trap, Chase. I've just seen what you did there. I've just seen what you did there. So, so we we asked Chase why in the world he would he would want to do that. Um, Daniel, why why would you want to uh, step outside of what we have known for at least my whole generation of using um, GMOs and well, why would you want to? What what made you decide you wanted to take your your farm and go a different direction? And what what all feeds do you supply? Well, Chris, honestly, dumb luck. It, it's definitely a niche market, but goodness, you've you've exposed it. And but the real answer is that, at least for my operation the status quo was not working. And so we were turning a lot of money and keeping very little to none. Who we had on the show that said that before? That might be Fad Montgomery. It might be Abus Denton. It could have been you. We and may have to go and check. So that was the start, was that we knew we needed something different. And then we, again, we just stumbled into... Uh, making animal feed. My background is dairy. That's what I grew up doing. I have no formal education. And uh, most of this is learned the hard way. And uh, our largest uh, things that we sell are um, poultry feed, broiler chickens. Uh, we make a chick starter layer feed for uh, egg laying flocks. We do um, turkey and game bird feeds. We sell a lot of hog feed. Uh, one thing that I personally... Um, think is really neat about our area is that we still have a fairly strong culture of uh, family hog killings. Yes, we do. And uh, so we sell a lot of hog feed, uh, more than you, more than I ever dreamed uh, that would be around in this area. And uh, most folks are not too much worried about uh, anything besides what actually is the ingredient list. You mentioned byproducts earlier. 
Uh, most folks that we would sell hog feed to are very uh, interested to make sure we do not have byproducts in it. Again, not saying that that's wrong. Uh, that's, that's what our customer base is looking for. Um, we basically make everything except for horse feed. And uh, we don't make horse feed because I have absolutely no experience with it whatsoever at all. And um, and horse folks can be a little troublesome. Perhaps. But peculiar. And, and then... Uh, peculiar. <laughs> I'm not troublesome. We, so much. we did try to make rabbit feed, and we never could get that one pulled off. Uh, to make rabbit feed well, it needs to be pelletized, and we do not have a way to pelletize feed. So we make uh, goat feed, sheep feed, uh, we make a dairy cow feed, we make a beef finisher feed, we make a heifer grower feed for cattle. And um, there's one thing I will say, and um, I'm, I'm, I've said it before, but it doesn't hurt to say it again. Um, Heather, my wife, had um, some issues with with store bought eggs, and it gave her a burning, you know, in the gut. Um, and and it we couldn't figure this out and, until we put our egg layers on your non GMO feed. So for anyone that that is out there and I'm sure there are plenty that have swung around and said, I can't eat eggs. They give me, you know, I've got a problem with it. The problem that you've got is not with the egg. It's with what's being fed the chicken and with the non-GMO feed that we now feed our egg layers, Heather can now eat eggs ad infinitum with no problem. So we're talking about, you know, the products that these battery layers what are what are they being fed? Because what we the feed that we're getting from you takes that out of the equation. And Heather's now happily eating omelets, poached eggs, fried eggs, scrambled eggs, you name it. But it's not just Heather either. It's a lot of people. In our in our little group, our tight yep. niche group, I mean, we've got what, ten to fifteen people yep. that 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 have come to the conclusion they can't eat eggs. And so Heather's like, well, y'all need to go to Daniel's and get feed. And almost all of them yep. ha haven't had any problems since changing. And that's with the chicken eating non -GM your non-GMO food from Greensburg Ag. Interesting. And you, you can only draw the one conclusion we can all draw. The battery-fed chickens are fed something that do not they, – they give something to egg production – that our bodies don't like. And I'm not going to make any scientific evidence or any paper about that, but it's pretty self-evident that that's the case. So when it comes to feeding your animals, yeah, absolutely. You better be careful what you put in your animal as to what you're going to get out of it. Couldn't agree more. Bonus. We say it like this. It's the food your food eats. Yeah. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. I don't, you know, and... And as we've discussed on here before, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of layers as to when you go to the grocery store, what all consists of well, cage free or range free or non GMO or this or this. I mean, you would think just by going in the store, you should be able to look at a label and it says cage free. You should be well, that chicken was never, but it's not the case. It there's a certain time limit. You know, it could be two weeks before, or it could be you know they. They get to run around for an hour a day or something. It's 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 a, it's a very arbitrary number that most of these places use just to be able to say it. Because when you're thinking free range, you're thinking, oh, it, it's a happy little chicken twenty four seven. That's not the case. It just has to be a happy little chicken a couple hours a day, right? I mean, it's so convoluted. The best what your options are at the store. You're really not getting what you think you're getting. The the the, the best description for. Um, chickens and the eggs that they produce is coming from a grass-fed, pasture-fed chicken. Because anyone that that where you see vegetarian egg, chickens are not vegetarians. I hate to break this truth to you, so you automatically know that that isn't what they naturally feed on. Okay, so a vegetarian-fed chicken ain't quite right. So what are you feeding it? Um, so yeah, the 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 pasture raised, um, free range. Uh, what's the word the government 
owns that you can't use and you've got to be certified to organic organic if anyone uses that word organic i just want to gag on it i'm sorry it's just horse shit um i said i wasn't going to swear on the show sorry i let that one slip but the organic moniker um that is owned by the government that you can't use you have to be certified to use it uh you've got to go through certain protocols it's it's nonsense so past your fed past your raised range free that's the sort of information you want to hear organic is irrelevant when it comes to that conversation but just dismiss it it means nothing <laughs> and it's a great shame but there we go chase what else casey farms what do they have to offer now processing well of course we have our own line of beef you know that we sell and so anything that you can think of as far as beef, we do do pork, um, are lamb. You, are you raising pork? What what we're doing with pork is um, a fellow that works for me, uh, Steve Rutra. And that would be my uncle. Yeah. <laughs> he uh, it would was, also be Jeremiah's father-in-law. Father yeah, I very, was with Steve yesterday at Marvin Webb's. Yeah, I heard about that. Oh, that was awful. So, so Steve raises hogs, and uh, he wanted to get involved with that, and so I guaranteed him a market. And uh, anybody comes along our place and wants to buy beef, generally wants a little bit of pork. So it's a win-win for him and, yep. and us too. So that's how that's our source of pork. Okay. Uh, now we had we had your whole hog sausage. Yeah. And and that to me that the. I'm talking about flavor flavor profiles, and it seems so food snobby. Whole hog sausage is something different in its entirety, and it is so superior. So when you see whole hog sausage out there, that's something you know um, you should be striving for because you can do so much with it. it. It's such a superior flavor. Yeah, I mean it should be because you're throwing the bacon in it you're throwing the tenderloin it's in it. all going in there yeah i mean i mean it's an expensive way of doing it. i don't know who in the world would do a whole hog sausage in my and this is just my opinion because i love my bacon i will fight somebody over my bacon yeah but me when, and my little two and a half year old fight all the time over the last piece of bacon um but yeah no it's that's good stuff that's good stuff Y'all really got me hungry. Yeah. So here, yeah. I mean, they, the more y'all talk about it. Y'all are, y'all offer lamb. Is We're doing that, lamb. Is that first yeah. come, first serve, or is that something y'all have readily available? It's a seasonal thing, but we have a good supply of it right now. Yeah. I've never, I want a lamb burger. I don't think I've ever had a lamb burger. I know you were making some up there a few weeks ago, but I didn't, I didn't barge in or anything on it, but they, it's not very good. Oh, for goodness. Oh, you're such a beef guy. I'm going to tell you what, a good bison burger, I don't know if you've ever had a good bison burger, but they're pretty tough to, in my opinion, they're pretty tough to beat. But I'm curious about a lamb burger. I've never had one, so. Heather does them just great. Uh Uh-huh. I'm sure Jess does too. Oh, yeah. Lamb burgers. But it's, again, what you put with it, you know? I mean, it, it 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 makes a burger more versatile. Yeah. And that can't be a bad thing, right? You know, because there's only so many burgers you can shove down your pie hole. It's a bit like, I, mean, I don't want to have five pizzas all week. No, don't do it. So it just gives you a bit of versatility with, with, with the burger option and, and ground lamb. Personally, I'd be looking at doing lamb kebabs. Um, but, you know, that's Hold just on. me. Lamb ka what? Kebabs. Oh, you're yeah. such a heathen, Billy. Really? You're such a savage. That was kebabs, you know. But... Kebabs. Kebabs. <laughs> kebabs. <laughs> You put another shrimp on the bobby. So, it's, Daniel, what, what all do you offer? I mean, we bought we buy hogs from you, or we we have bought a couple of hogs from you. Um, do you offer beef as far as selling a live animal to somebody or lamb or? So our business is structured. Um, so we have basically four marketing branches or four marketing um, streams that we use. Uh, the very top of the list is actually uh, grain for human consumption. So think grits, cornmeal, sifted flour, wheat berries. Uh, we offer a uh, puff cereal line, believe it or not. So puff Which is puff. superb, and I believe you're one of the only people in this state that has access to it. 
Me and Kellogg's, basically, but yeah. And yeah, but Kellogg's <laughs> doesn't count. It's a little different. So uh, then the next uh, layer down is, um, you know, we would have a seed. We we do um, a lot of seed. So we would do both perennial seeds for like overseeding a pasture, like that you mentioned earlier, or uh, or Simon did, I believe. And then we do annual seeds for cover cropping. Uh, you know, large scale stuff. You know, from from uh, big farm fields to even something like your garden. Uh, then the next thing down is we offer the animal feeds like we've talked about before. And uh, then we have a, um, a small herd of hogs that we, uh, that we keep, that we sell across, you know, starting from about uh, 60 pounds as feeders, 40 to 60 pounds as feeders, all the way up to finished hogs as large as you would like them to be. And uh, then we also have, um, we have a flock of sheep. So we have lamb sales as well. Uh, we don't sell any cuts of meat. All the animals are live. That's how we've chosen to do an operation. Uh, we have a part of our business is uh, we do uh, also handle um, hay and straw, which if you're selling it is never enough. And if you're putting it up, is always way too much. I think that's about it. I'll tell you what, I don't know um, if y'all are familiar with Parisburg, but there's a store down there, I think called the the Walker Valley Store. What does Chris do? What'd you do? Did you bust it? I think Chris broke something. I didn't break it. It was broke before I touched it. Uh huh. Go ahead and finish. That's going. That's going to cost you. Well, yeah. Take it out of your paycheck. Well, no. I actually, I've I've been by this place before. <clears throat> I hadn't had a chance to stop before. I had a had a had a delivery. But it, I mean, it's it's like I mean, not granted, it's in the middle of nowhere. It's halfway between like Parisburg and Bland, but no less. I mean, it's a store probably the size of uh, of a Dollar General, a little bit bigger. Shopping carts and the whole works. And a good 60, 70% of the stuff in there is all local. Like they've got an entire aisle, all the kinds of meats you could want, all the kind of produce. I think, thank it's Amish who run the place. Um, but you can get just, I mean, they have all your local jams, all your local produce, all your local pork, um, chickens, beef. Like, I really hope at some point in time, like we can have something like that around here, like a place that the, the whole class. Now, granted, I know I know the the Morris Hotel is going to be there, but have another one popped off in one part of the county, something where the you know kind of like the 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 creamery, but expanded. You know, another place maybe on the north or uh, south side of the county, like like these places should be popping up everywhere. You yeah, know, I, I, I don't. I think you know, of course, it better serves y'all gentlemen, but I think it better serves everybody else as well. Like the community, like you you spoke a lot about kind of like where we have fallen as a society and, and kind of and, and like how our habits have changed down the line. I think, you know, part of that's just really getting back to, you know, just sitting down and talking with the people who are in charge of that kind of, that's what I said the other day. I said, go down to the farmer's market. If for nothing else, developing relationships with some of the people who are tasked to feed you, get to know them, get in and get to know Cricker. You know, he's down there, you know, how do you start a conversation with him? We'll ask him about sitting in hurricanes with Amos Denton, and that'll get you going right there. You know what I mean? They're, like, there's so many different people down there. Ask him about his road trip. Well, I, I, that's what I was alluding to. Um, but, I mean, like, I, I think it's very, very important that we all continue down this path, and we continue to learn about the things y'all are doing, the things like Chris is doing, the things that they're doing. Because if everybody – develops those relationships you're more apt to, to to go spend your money there and they're more apt to take their money and reinvest it back you go to kroger as we said 100 times before you go to walmart they don't care that money's going to arkansas that's going to barely pay the employees that run this place and the rest of us going to arkansas so the the more you can sit down and learn these different things well and that's just like talking about and we've stated it earlier you know when you buy something from daniel say seed and you go out and you plant it and, and it doesn't come up or or, it's, or it's, it just looks off you can call daniel daniel's going to take the time out he's going to ride over and y'all can discuss you know what maybe went wrong and try to come up with a plan you're not going to get that when you go to walmart or lowe's and buy seed and but, now granted if you're buying from daniel you're probably not buying walmart i mean grass that particular grass seed uh, same way with Chase, you know, if you, if you take a product to have processed at Chase's and I'll be the first one to tell you, you need to spend the time. If you know, if you're going to have an animal process, you need to spend the time. If you don't know nothing about the cut sheet, you need to do some research and you and you need to talk to Chase because he is the, the processor and, and Chase will spend 
20, 30 minutes to an hour with you going through the cut sheet to make Well, these sure. guys are master butchers. Well, I to mean, make you sure know. that you get what you want. Yeah. Because if you send your, well, I mean, you're going to go to Walmart or Kroger and buy what you see. But, um, you know, if you take it down to Lynchburg, I'm sure them guys do a good job. But if you're from the county, from Franklin County, and you take your meat to Lynchburg to have it processed, and something comes back wrong, they're less likely to work with you and try and make amends on the next one or, or you know, try to build a relationship because, well, I mean, they're an hour and a half away from you. They care less whether they see and, you and the stress, And the stress that you're putting the animal under during that, you know, transfer yeah. from, from farm to processing um, facility is, is not a good thing. You, you want to minimize that. You know, because you can you. <laughs> I'm not going to say you're going to taint the flavor at all, but an animal under stress um, definitely puts out uh, something that can affect the flavor. Um, but one of the best things that Daniel did, uh, this is going back a few years, um, we came up, we developed a pasture, um, knowing that I was looking to expand some of our our sheep and lambs, and I just had to do it. The best thing he did was say, you need to put two tons of chicken litter on that pasture. Best advice I've ever received. That Works, stuff. Oh, dude. Yeah. And so, we, you know, we, we might be competition, but we're not. We're not competition because we are a symbiotic community relationship that will thrive because we have raised the bar. This is what we're looking to do. And it, this isn't hard. This shouldn't be rocket science, especially coming from a hooligan like myself. You know, we can do this. So spreading this word about local produce and having more outlets for it um, with USDA uh, stamped proteins um, and, and all the products and, and feed that you can supply, we are in a far better place. And you'll lead them from the front. Good job. I kind of have to ask too, because I know a few people. I, I said I post some of this stuff on social media, and I'd ask, and some people are asking, you know, for you all with the beef. I mean, has any kind of new regulations come in here recently? And because something come out about the mRNA being applied to cattle, is that something that y'all have been ha, had brought to y'all's attention here at any point in time? Is that something that they brought? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Is that something that, that's that's a reality or is that just speculation at this point in time? I don't I don't think that's a reality in cattle. I didn't think so. But I mean there there've been a lot of people talking There's about been, it. That was a lot of hype and a lot of people got concerned with it. But a lot of fear mongering. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we've got to be very that's... cautious about that. Because the fear mongering is is what is driving this this narrative. Um, is all about fear mongering, and I'm not talking about the narrative with big agriculture, um, or, or 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 anything. The whole society is being fed, um, you know, fear, and I don't think we need to be participating in that. Well, it's so constant, exactly because of information flow, yeah, internet, social media, whatever you want to call it. Stuff spread so fast. Well, is that something that has been like proposed or spoken about within the, the ranks of the government, or is that just something that was brought up as? I'm, well, I'm, I'm sure that I'm, I'm sure Bill, I'm sure they really want us to have the MNR, M and mRNA vaccine. I'm sure they've talked about it, but as far as us local guys, nobody has come to me and said, "Hey, you're going to have to give your cows this." this well, I think that's important as well because a lot of times, you know, you 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 want to think about, you know as as natural and healthy as possible i i don't i don't think there's any question that 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 children are, you know teenagers are becoming much more developed but a much younger age than they did when we were in school and i'm sure you know back in the you know late 1800s when simon was coming through school i think <laughs> you know i mean th things have changed and, and and you know there's a lot of studies that attribute that to the, to the hormones and the steroids that are being injected in the meat and in this meat you're going and getting you know, from fast food joints and things like that. I mean, you, you, the bad kind of stuff right there. And it's not just that's in the chicken, it's in everything. So if you're going... Yeah, but isn't that isn't that a, 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 a case in point 
for what you put in is what you get out. Oh, exactly. So when you're dealing with local producers, there's no way that our local producers are going to allow this kind of crap to go on. The, the This is in the mind of the Bill Gates and and these these narcissists, okay? So I mean, staying, staying to, local can negate that. They're, they're, they're shutting down farms. They're trying to, you know, over Holland. in Holland. Apparently, they just come out, you know, once again, they haven't had a chance to fact check this, so looking through it, but, you know, the United States just signed on with 13 other countries or something that's essentially trying to start, you know, suppressing the, the small farms and whatnot in and, and the name of climate change, which, I mean, these are all just things that, that granted, do bring on conspiratorial ideas, but at the same time, things we were saying 15 or 20 years ago might have been conspiratorial are now coming true. You know, things that people dismissed as, as ridiculous, we're all starting to see how many of those things are coming to fruition. Well, and, who's- and it's not... You know, these these lunatics are not going to stop until your producers will not. Your producers will not do it willingly. Um, John Kerry. But, but better yet, I think it's the public, the, the consumers will probably take more of an of an uh, activism to prevent that happen, especially, you know, since covid. A lot of people have started paying attention to what what's going on with their food, what's in their food. Rightly so. Um, and, and I I think before it even gets to the farmer's hand being forced to do it, I think the public will stand up. Um, We'd like to think so. Well, yeah. I, I think but, I think what we're doing here actually is preempting that. Um, I heard something this morning um, that had me raging. Uh, and it was John Kerry trying to um, bring in his climate change agenda whilst he's flying around on a private jet that he denied owing. Well, because owning it's his wife's. That was, that was I mean, owned, on, owned his by wife's. his wife. So we, we, we know the lies and fraud behind this agenda to start with. Um, but John Kerry was bringing up something that was trying to associate climate change and, and put it firmly... Uh, and the blame firmly on 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 the plate of big ag, you know, thirty percent of of the climate issues that we're experiencing, he was trying to attribute to 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 agriculture, and and this guy needs to shut the hell up, quite frankly, because we know this is nonsense. He flies around on a jet that he didn't own, that was owned by his wife, that he denied owning. Uh, on on the behest of oh well you know I'm I'm my my carbon footprint is you know blah blah blah. Watch out when you hear these associations with agriculture and and climate change. Um, that aggravated me this morning immensely. That jet and that I'm being very I'm being very polite about this yeah. right now. <laughs> that jet that he's riding around on probably two two trips or where he's going burns more fuel than either one of our tractors sitting in here except for the combine. <laughs> well don't even talk about the amount of tons of fuel that I have personally been part of expending on the yeah. atmosphere, putting in wind farms in the Dutch German English uh, wind sectors doing wind farms. So we've been burning, and we've had fleets and fleets and fleets of boats burning hundreds of tons of fuel a day, putting in wind farms. So, so hundreds of tons of fuel. You probably have two or three boats there with just fuel in it to fill everything else. Yep. So just, there's one thing I want to address right quick. Uh, on one of our farming episodes, I think it was the one called The Ugly Truth, uh, there was a comment that was made uh, by somebody who listened to it. And uh, it, it, I don't remember exactly how it was worded, but it was something about using, you shouldn't use fear tactics to promote your local businesses or promote your businesses. Um, and I, and, 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 and I well think, done. I think everybody in this room, uh, what we were saying is not fear mongering. Um, 
or using fear to promote our businesses. It's the simple truth is uh, you can look at studies and the food that you buy in big box stores that have been, I mean, they have Roundup uh, traces. I mean, they have chemical traces in them that, that are used either in on the farm, on the farm, or in the process of getting those foods ready to sell for the public use. Um, and I, you know, if we're using fear tactics, right, to sell local products that are infinitely better for you, you have been subject to a fear campaign um, way right. beyond anything that I can subject you to, okay? And that's called the mainstream media. So I'm going to leave that one well alone. Anyone who makes that comment is a very poorly educated individual that, quite frankly, I will disregard. Yeah. So I don't care. If that's your opinion, have at it. You know, I know what I'm putting in my body, and it's coming from producers that we have around this table right now. And if you find that objectionable, I don't know what else to say. But normally I'd say something quite rude, but I'm not going to. Well, well, I guess my final question before we get out of here, rolling up on a couple hours now, is, I mean, you all, you gentlemen, being on the front lines of things, you all kind of speak with a lot of these different farmers, different people producing every single day. Y'all think we're going to pull out on the other other side of this all right? I mean, you 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 obviously you're doing it because you believe in it, but, I mean, it's, it's, it's tough to predict what tomorrow is going to bring. But, I mean, do y'all think regardless of what happens tomorrow, as long as we keep doing kind of what we're doing around here, we're going to be all right at least. We're going to be able to pull through. I mean, barring, barring any, you know, any, anything kind of catastrophic. Like, I mean, y'all, y'all, you think we're on the right path right here, what we're doing. You think we have, you know, the possibility to, to stick out above all, all others. Yeah, I'm encouraged. I mean, I think, like we talked earlier, I yeah. think we're on, I think we're headed in a good direction. I would agree with that. And uh, for me- I think we have to. We have to be positive about the direction and path that we've chosen. And I don't, I don't get sucked into a lot of politics. I'll be honest with you. Um, I'll try and avoid it. I but- feel like, I feel like. The people that are doing things and getting things done are going to be the same people, irregardless of who's yeah. Who's it's going to be the same faces, and and I don't get too stuck on any of that. And we will I just, win. I just keep trudging along. Well, that's 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 what we try and and bring to people is like, look, it doesn't really matter, you know, who's going to be in the White House. It really does. At the end of the day, get to know the people like you. Get to know the people who do have the food, who are providing services, like because. Can't nobody in DC. They really can't do. Well, what can they really do? I mean, they can sit there and they can say something. It, it, it matters to hill of beans what Joe Biden says. I don't care. I'm not going to listen to it. I'm going to go on about my life and do what I have to do. So you know, I think a lot of people out there, they you know, they do get caught up in the politics a whole lot more. And I pay attention to it to, to a degree to where I can try and and relate what's going on culturally to you all and vice versa. And, and you know, I just I think there's a lot of people out there right now. They need that that beacon of hope. They need to understand. Well, hey, even if it really hits a fan tomorrow, I think we have a community around here that's going to be able to pull through. It's not going to be tough. I mean, it's going to be tough. It's not going to be easy. We have to give up some of our creature comforts, but we've got the infrastructure in place, you know, to make sure that whatever happens, and no matter who's who's in office or who's making the calls, we'll find ways. And it, and it might not be traditional might not be cash you might be favors you might say well hey i got this for you, you got this for but 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 just know we have the infrastructure in place i think a lot of people a lot of people are taking a lot of um take taking at the heat they're, they're- well frank franklin county is a, a an agricultural industrial hub and and as far as that goes guess what if you ain't got food you ain't got nothing right guess what we got food we can do it as far as that, you know, that, that, that scenario that scenario of it's all going to end tomorrow, and I don't feed into that either. You know, we we got to plod on. we got to make the best situation of what we got. I think we've got to embrace our local producers. We've got to have outlets for our local producers. We've got to get away from the big box stores. We've got to keep our money local. And every step that we make to keep our money local enriches our community um, tenfold 
So if you think you're, you know, spending 20 bucks on a steak from a big box store, maybe spend 22 bucks on the same steak from locally produced, you know, because that that money is going to enhance our community. That's all like that. That's all we got, you know, and I, I, I firmly believe this community is going to pull through regardless and we're going to come out much richer um, uh, in a in. in I, I just think our our health is going to improve um, spiritually, and yeah. I and I hope people are listening they're taking this advice and they're doing the same things in their community. They're piecing things together. They're putting people together. They're making contacts. They're networking, doing all they can because you know you Taliban told us anything. You you can't kill a spirit, and you know same thing with the Viet Cong. I mean, at the end of the day, you do you. You keep your tunnel vision straight and. I think from come out. I got the big, the I end. got the big ten, and I'm good to go. Yeah, exactly. And that's what it's about. So, for you, gentlemen, real quick, before we get off here, I'm Daniel to finish it. You was getting ready to say something about pull. You know, if you think we'll pull out on the other side, it'd be hard. The only thing I was going to say was that you know, um, we got to eat. We that's the basis of humanity, right? Figured out yet how not to eat and survive, and it doesn't come from a lab. It don't. I don't care. Well, so for, for, for y'all three, tell everybody where, where they can find y'all three need y'all services. I guess we'll start with you, Chase, because the person I was looking at in point two pointed at you. So, Oh, well, we're Casey Farm Meats. We've got a pretty easy to remember phone number. It's uh, 365 Cows, so you can't miss us there. we also got a website. You probably Google us. We'll pop right up there. But we're in Farham, um, located about two or three miles past Farham College. But uh, if, 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 if you need any local meat or local meat processing, give us a call. We're here. We want to we want to work with everyone we can. I'll get some of that lamb. Daniel? Sure. So um, Green Sprig Ag is located uh, about a mile and a half off of Route 40, about probably six miles from uh, Chase's place. We're right behind Boland's Hot Dogs between Six Mile Post and uh, Boland's Hot Dogs right off of Old Forge Road. Mm. And if you can't find us, ask your neighbor. Or just ask me. Yeah. Or ask Simon. <laughs> <laughs> well, y'all know who I am. Uh, Foggy Ridge Cattle Company. You can uh, call me or my brother-in-law um, or Simon. I'll put you in the uh, right direction, folks. I tell you, it's just a case of joining the dots. Yeah. Uh, b- beef is the only thing we offer other than a headache. Yeah. Well, I got both. <laughs> Got the headache right here and the beef down in the refrigerator or freezer's got that bought last week. And I got a quart of cow getting processed probably as we speak right now because can't get away from those damn dentons. <laughs> so <laughs> But I, I like I like keeping the uh I like keeping that connection alive. So anytime he calls, we'll go ahead and grab me a quarter. But we'll maybe some ribs in there and whatnot. So we're gonna be good on meat for quite some time. So I'm pretty thrilled about that. But uh gentlemen, I want y'all to thank y'all very much for coming out here tonight. It was an interesting episode. I know um, there's so many questions when it comes to stuff. I know so many people right now are are asking a lot of questions and they're fearful. So it's good for people to come, be able to kind of explain things out to them and kind of maybe ease some of their uh, their worries and their trepidations. Uh, so for you know everybody out there, like I said once again, the people take care of us on our end. It's Rocky Mountain Smokehouse, uh, Rocky Mountain Burger Company. Um, for everybody like that. Uh, Patreon.com slash get on tap where you can go subscribe to us one more time. But, but word of mouth is the best. By the way, if you're listening to this and whatever it is, uh, uh, Google, whether you're listening to it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, go leave a review. The more you leave a review, the higher up we go. It doesn't matter. You can sit there and say Simon Smells and put five stars there. Just put the five. It doesn't matter what you say. If for some reason it works. So, and then word of mouth helps. So tell your friends, tell everybody. It, it's better than any social media. That, that you sit around and listen to a bunch of jokes like this for a couple hours, talk about farming. That really goes a long way. So uh, for everybody out there that listens and pays attention, for gentlemen in here tonight giving us your time, uh, we certainly appreciate it. And Daniel, Chase, thank you very much. This has been a great show. The great ironic input. part about this is I generally listen to these episodes while I'm farming. Mm-hmm. Ain't that the fact? Uh, we're on a tractor <laughs> earpiece in but uh thank you guys for your input it's it's we're developing a, a community and it takes all of us thank you we didn't signal Changing things, they pulled him over, found 
her cocaine She said I love you Yes I love you forever time locked up she ran around everyone knew it small country town while he lay rotten Lord, she was blowing on his dog and the day She forgotten Did she still care 